Ladies and gentlemen of the Shred Gaming Telecom video, we're going to talk about all things graphics cards because we have a few major pieces of news which have popped up over the last few days. Some concerning AMD, some as you'd expect concerning Nvidia. We're going to start things out with AMD, a small piece of news. It's not amazing, but we finally have at least some hints regarding the Fury X2, which of course is the dual graphics card which AMD have been hinting at for some time now. Unfortunately, no, we don't have details in regarding to the clock speed, but we have a teased PR image, which is popped up on Twitter from Scott Watts, uh, Watson, excuse me, and it's essentially just two um, Fiji XT GPUs held in his hand. Not anything exciting, but these are very much the marketing strategies AMD have used before officially unveiling the card. It's basically just to whet people's appetite. We don't know massive amounts about the GPU. The basic theory behind the card from what we've heard from leaks and rumours is it's going to put out around 16.5-ish T-flops of, uh, of uh, FP32 performance, which is pretty damn impressive for single precision. And when one considers that it's a small form factor, about 375 watts TDP, I have a feeling it's going to do fairly well in the market considering it's fairly short shelf life. Do you remember, of course, that the real star in the room, if you excuse the pun, would be AMD's own Polaris graphics cards. Speaking of Polaris, you like the segue there? Admit you liked it. We're going to move on to Polaris here because the minimum VR spec is an issue for everyone. Now, essentially speaking, it goes down to the fact that the current hardware to run virtual reality is rather pricey. This isn't really a surprise considering that the ideal, I guess you could say the ideal environment to enjoy, say, the Oculus Rift is a minimum of 2K in terms of resolution at 90 frames per second. That is not cheap to to actually run. You're looking at like a GTX 970 or above, or an R9 290, or once again above. I'll let AMD's Roy Taylor explain in a fairly lengthy quote, but one that's pretty, pretty critical. Now I'd like to address a different challenge for us, and that is called the total available market. One of the issues we have, the minimum spec for the PC to run the Oculus and HTC headsets, is 90 FPS and 2K resolutions. Now, to do that, you either need a Radeon 290X or a GTX 970, both of which retail at $350, US, well, 349 if you want the exact quote. The challenge we have is to look at the total number of these GPUs that have been sold, according to JPR. That's an install base of just 7.5 million units. Now, that's an issue because you can only sell 7.5 million of anything because that's the number of that can run those headsets. I'm very, very pleased to tell you that we invested in something called Polaris, which we think can address the problem. I'll move on to the second part of the quote, and one can argue this is probably the most important and critical part. AMD have just completed the shrink to 14nm with the Polaris architecture. What this means is that when this comes to everyone in the room, that we can produce GPUs that will run a minimum spec of VR at a lower cost, in larger product volume, consuming less power, and run faster. That means that the second half of the year and going forwards, more people will be able to run those headsets with a much larger than that means we can make the market a lot larger for everybody in the room. Do remember that this was at a uh, VR conference, so hence the reason he's speaking such a way. What does that mean? Well, it basically means that assuming the quote is accurate this backs up a lot of what amd have said in the past it's isn't amazingly new information instead it's confirmation of what has been said and where we're hoping the gpus of tomorrow are going what it essentially means is that the cards which are costing let's say 350 us dollars are probably going to be more like 200 50-ish to maybe 300 to put out the same levels of performance. This is what I've been saying for some time. It's just that the price of gaming now is kind of more expensive. This is why I was saying that for the sake of argument, if you were to look at, oh, what's the big one that's getting everyone upset right now? Quantum Break. That's a good one. 
So Quantum Break, for example, if you look at the minimum specifications of that, then the recommended, because now they've just updated that, and of course a GTX 970 is now recommended, whereas a 980 tire or a Fury, for the ultra bleeding edge specs, you know, if you want everything at absolute max, you know, in six months time, 12 months time, that's no longer going to be the case because we're going to finally move on to these faster architectures. So I think it's just good for everyone that this happens. Obviously, what he was saying about 7.5 million, it does not necessarily equate to truth. The reason I say that is because you can have a chap who has, let's say, a SLI setup of something that may be a bit older. Let's say you could have a 78, yeah, 780 Ti uh, SLI setup. Or you could have, let's say, a 7970 Crossfire setup. It's not ideal for running virtual reality because you've got p potentially VRAM issues and that type of stuff. But you could still do it. And, you know, you just don't know the weird, wonderful configurations that people have got. Even so, I think it's a good thing that we're starting to move towards these uh, faster and quicker cards. Now, the main one for NVIDIA that, of course, everyone's looking forward to is Pascal. Pascal is essentially the answer to Polaris. People are already out arguing over forums which one's going to be the better card. No one really knows, of course, at the moment. What we do know, however, is the card is going to revolutionise NVIDIA's own lineup of GPUs, and it will, of course, also mark the first HBM card from NVIDIA as well. Remember, AMD did have the um, current lineup of Furies to at least get some, I guess you could say, practice, whereas NVIDIA are not going to do that. They're just going to move straight to Pascal. So, we kind of have the card shipping. Now, I'm not referring to actually, you know, on store shelves that don't rush to Amazon or what have you. Instead, we're starting to see engineering samples, new engineering samples, which are originating from China, pop up. And this is obviously a good thing. This is probably a good indication that NVIDIA are working on the cards. And all four of these cards actually start with the same 699 serial number. Now, from what we can tell, and once again this is a lot of speculation, unfortunately, for some reason or another, NVIDIA don't really feel comfortable to give us all of their uh, comings and goings, if you will, but it looks like that those cards come from at least December. Now, do you remember that Pascal was not, I repeat, not at CES. And NVIDIA had decided to show off the Pascal Drive PX2 module, which essentially was using Maxwell GPUs. And there was has been a lot of conversation on the internet that essentially NVIDIA's cards were just not ready, that they hadn't really started to get to the point where basically you could run games on them. They were just too early in production, which is fair enough. You know, hardware takes a lot of time to bring to fruition a lot of the time. So what this could mean is now NVIDIA are actually releasing the PCBs. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're working. Very important to remember that. Just because a card is described as computer graphics cards, that's how it's spelled in big old block letters, it could just be that we're looking at non-complete circuit boards. So, for example, it could be the entire board, but without the, let's say, HBM in it. Or it could be the entire board without any of the GPU components, it's literally just the basic board. Or it could be the board, but without the HDMI, the display ports, the everything other than the very, very basic PCB. Or it could be maybe a mock-up with maybe the cooling solution to send to certain people. It's too difficult to know. What it does show, however, is NVIDIA are slowly incrementing the uh, components because remember first one we saw was back in 16th of December the latest we've seen is the 5th of this year uh, 2016 so once again they're slowly incrementing them it's 
a good thing. It's a step that they're working towards things, but it's just kind of how it is. And unfortunately, we also don't know which variant of, Mac of uh, Pascal these are either. It could be GP100, it could be GP104, it could be something a bit differently. All we can do is wait. Now, I do want to have a quick rundown of what we know about Pascal because we've done so several times over regarding Polaris, so it's only fair that we do very similar. So, what is it we know? Well, obviously, the first thing first is it's going to be a fully direct X12 level card. This means it's going to be at least 12.1 compliant or higher. Now, the card is supposed to be released and this is the important part because there are two two differing opinions from different analysts. The first is that we could see the release, let's say, summer-ish, early, late summer. That's one window. Another is that actually the card's nowhere near that far along, and it could be even Christmas-ish it comes out. Unfortunately, we just don't know what it is at the moment, and the video are remaining fairly tight-lipped. Now, it will be built on 16NM FinFET processors, much like AMD's, and also will feature a 4096-bit memory interface with HBM2, which will, of course, be 16GB of VRAM and can actually go up to 8 high stack for 32GB, but that will likely, just like AMD's cards, will likely remain for the professional-level compute cards. We don't know how or when we'll see that for customer variants. Typically, as one knows, at least if you were to look at older cards from NVIDIA, they release, for example, the GTX 9, uh, sorry, 780, and then the 980, then they release um, the Titans or something similar, and then they release the 980 ties or the 780 ties or what have you. So it could be that we'll see a very similar type of uh, of uh, product releases from NVIDIA in the next generation, but we just, of course, don't know. It's possible, therefore, that the equivalent of the 980 tie will feature 16 gigabytes of VRAM, but the Titan equivalent could indeed feature up to 32 gigabytes, because remember, one of the purposes of Titan initially was that it offered better compute performance, but also really good game performance. The latter Titans from Maxwell didn't manage to do that because of just the architecture, so instead Maxwell, Ma um, I'm sorry, Maxwell's uh, Titan essentially was just more powerful for gaming. Um, simplifying things a bit, but you get the idea. And just like AMD, the performance per watt is going to be drastically improved. AMD, of course, have shown off demonstrations of this and it's looking to be absolutely incredible in terms of what they're managing to actually achieve. We could probably guesstimate there's going to be a very similar amount of performance per watt with Maxwell over AMD. We can probably guess that simply because of what we've seen from the shrinkage, if you will, for the 16NM FinFET process. Either way, it's going to be kind of cool. There are some other things that we could talk about. Unfortunately, most of these, it looks like for now, are going to be focused primarily on servers. For example, NVLink, which as I've mentioned before, is not really for um, a standard uh, CPU from Intel or AMD. Instead, it's going to be for server-based, uh, IBM-based mainframes, at least um, unless AMD, uh, NVIDIA change this. But it's all good stuff. Finally, a couple of small little bits and pieces that I do want to throw in here. Um, this is not a big piece of news, I just want to mention them just in case anyone's curious. Tomb Raider, it looks like it's going to have a Direct 812 patch. We've heard many rumours of this and I mentioned it a couple of days ago actually in a different video. But... There's just been another update, and this one supposedly improves performance in non-CPU bound situations. What that means is, let's say for the sake of argument, your GPU is just not capable of keeping up with drawing stuff on screen. That's when things are going to start improving. Let's say the equivalent of the hair effects and all that. You should see a slight improvement in frame rate. How much, of course, is probably down to your own rig, what hardware you're using, all that stuff. And finally, um, just to clarify, 
there has been a small update concerning the minimum specifications of Quantum Break. While yes, the 980 type or equivalents are still for the ultra recommended, oh my god, what the hell specific uh, graphics settings. The actual recommended has been slightly reduced to a GTX 970, which is still pretty high. But I think it's fairly, I think it's fairly fair, if that made any sense, considering what this game is probably going to look like. What I'm curious about, let's say you're running at 1080p. What the hell graphic settings do you need to put the game at to make it look like the Xbox One? So for the sake of argument, you know, what's it going to look like at the lowest settings compared to the Xbox One or the medium settings compared to the Xbox One and so on. It's going to be kind of interesting because of the Xbox One's hardware is not fully DirectX 12 uh, compliant. It can't maybe make use of some of the special effects. It's it, it just going to be kind of interesting. Anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.